Hi guys, welcome back. And uh, now I'm off from Cartagena to Medellin in, in Colombia. I left actually because it was going to be about a 10 to 11 hour ride, which turned into a 13 and a half hour ride. I left actually before first light and stopped off about an hour outside of Cartagena. And this is where I got started. Uh, beautiful day's ride. Um, I had, uh, I, I, whilst I was in Cartagena, I got my uh, two new tyres out, two, two new tyres on their hide and our Scout uh, K60s. Um, and uh, I got a new rear rim put on the bike and I got a full service. Now, the guys in Cartagena had my bike for eight days. I had to return it once because um, uh, uh, they, they'd done something wrong. I can't remember what they'd done wrong the, the first time I returned it. Um, and um, later on in this trip, I, once I got into Medellin, I realized there was something they'd done wrong also because uh, coolant was, was spewing out of my, uh, you gotta watch out for the doggies there. Um, coolant was spilling out of my, um, my coolant tank. Um, not only that, the front tire, and even though I'd had it back in in, uh, in Cartagena, I'd have the bike back for two days. It's very difficult to know when you're only losing a tiny amount of air. It's very difficult to know that you're losing it because when you start the bike up in the morning, the the, the, the tire is cold, so the air pressure is lower and it builds back up again once the tires get warm. Um, it's just the way um, air particles interact. Um, uh, with friction and stuff like that. So um, I didn't realize until I got a consistent uh, heat in the bike that I was actually still losing some air from the bike. It was really slow. Like it was only like one PSI every four or five hours um, or you know, one PSI every three hours or something. But on this trip, I'd lost about four or five PSI over the trip, which with my experience beforehand, I knew was going to progressively get worse, you know. Um, so for me, it was going to be a frust frustrating, uh, frustrating time. And I was only spending two nights in in Medellin, um, and uh, yeah, I was I was pretty annoyed. Um, but I didn't find out about the coolant. I mean, you would you'd never know that they what they didn't do is there's a little seal ring, a little O ring that goes on the uh, around the cap of the coolant and they hadn't put that back on so until the bike gets hot you don't know that you lose you know that the bike's overheating and I, I didn't notice anything uh, when I was just uh, test riding it around uh, around Cartagena I didn't notice anything until yeah until I got to Medellin and if you've ever been to Medellin you'll know that the, the traffic in and out of the city is insane I got there late so I got there at close you know people closing you know people going home from work I was going into the city and it was insanity. It was, it said like I had 20 miles to go. I was in a place called Bula, 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 Bula. Um, and I thought, it says 25 miles. It says one hour and 10 minutes. And I'm thinking, it can't, you know, one hour and 20 minutes, that can't be right. What was it even 25? It was like 20 miles. Um, So yeah, I ended up having to stop my bike on the side of the road for about an hour, uh, waiting for it to cool down to continue on, um, which was just deeply frustrating. After a 13 and a half hour day, well, it ended up being a 13 and a half hour day. Should have been around about 11 to 12, but beautiful riding through the mountains and um, uh, in Medellin, uh, on the way to Medellin. Um, and was starting to really get a feel for what, what I was going to be uh, in for further down the road, um, going through the Andes, and uh, it's just spectacular. But this was uh, more pasture land here uh, for the first part of the trip, and it was spe spectacular. Um, you know, it was really beautiful days riding. Um, a lot of little towns along the way, so it was, you know, you weren't, you, you never got a real consistent. Uh, long stretch of you know, going pretty quick and, and as you can see with the dogs they're freaking everywhere and so you've always got to be a little bit wary of them um, 
you'll find that through through towns, um, if you're going pretty slowly, they'll come up and have a crack at you. You know, and uh, I found the best the best way to deal with them if you didn't have any cars behind you was to um, well, you've got when, whenever that ha whenever you get uh, dogs coming at you, if you can stop, just stop because they'll just look at you and go, hey, what the freaking hell are you doing? The game works like this. You ride slowly. I try to bite your, bite your legs and I bark really loud at you. And then you keep go you accelerate and keep going. You don't stop. And when you stop, they just look at you and go, what, what are you doing? Um, so, and, and especially uh, dogs around towns because they're used to having people around. And if, they, if all they were doing is biting people or walking around, then they would have, they'd be shot dead. So. You don't. You just. If you can stop, you just stop. Um, the thing about the thing about accelerating, it's okay to accelerate, but when you're in a town and you've got people around and all this stuff going on, it, that could be a bad idea because you're more than likely you're not going to be able to outrun the dog because you're not going to be able to go fast enough. So the best thing is to just stop, just look at them for a second. They'll walk away and then just slowly move away. Um, it was, uh, yeah. It became increasingly a problem as you keep, as I kept going south. But it's, um, it's just something you deal with. I got, I got uh, once in uh, uni in Bolivia. I got bitten pretty badly. I had got cut, cut my leg. Had to go and get some antiseptic and put it in there. Uh, there was about five dogs through. It was like. And that was another thing too about accelerating. Like I was going through, it was like pothole after pothole. So there was no opportunity to accelerate other than possibly making it even worse for yourself. So these are the guys that cut it. These were really nice guys. And as you can see, the KTM dealership is a pretty slap happy affair there. Uh, the, the, and you'll see later on, the shop in Medellin was a lot better. Um, it was, um, it was a real professional looking shop and those guys helped me out. They took my bike the first day I was there. The second day I was there, they had my bike because I was only there for two days and they fixed the, 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 the leak. They put a new ring on the sealant thing. So that fixed that problem immediately. Um, and, but they couldn't do anything with the tire. They didn't have enough time. So I had to just deal with the tire. Um, but uh, they were really nice guys. The guys in Cartagena are really nice as well, but they just didn't, you know, it was my fault because they just weren't equipped to handle a bike like mine. And since I've got back to Miami, I've realized that they've also, uh, you know, all, all the dealers are supposed to log when you get a service and they didn't, only out of the three major, uh, Mexico City, uh, Mexico City, uh, Cartagena, Mexico City, and um, yeah, so I had three major services along the way and only one of them logged into the computer that I'd had a service, which I think was Mexico City, uh, which is really annoying because, you know, when you want to sell your, if you ever want to sell your bike, you want to make sure that you've got all your service records up to date and stuff like that. And KTM do know because it's all computerized, but I, I spoke to the guys at KTM here, and they're gonna they're gonna log it in the system. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's a it's, it's servicing your bike will be an issue um, whether you've got a new bike or an old bike. In certain countries, BMW is the king, um, and you, you'll be able to get good service for your BMs, your, your GSs, and that. Um, and there's all Kawasaki and. Honda, all these that you'll have an opportunity to service. And you, in some ways, like some of the guys like we're on the um, KLRs and stuff like that, they they will, you know, they, they, they're, they're set up properly. There's a nice little uh, dinner. Um, they're all set up properly, you know, uh, because like everybody, so there's a lot of those bikes around, maybe not the KLRs, but the, there's a lot of those makes and models around, so um, there's a lot of parts and all this sort of stuff. So even if you get into trouble, if you can get to a town, even a small type, you know, medium, small, medium town, you'll be able to get service. You'll see on the right hand side, there's bike places everywhere um, that service bikes because, you know, 
more than half the, the bikes on the road are, uh, half the vehicles on the road are bikes. So there's a lot of mopeds and stuff like that. There's also a lot, just a lot of basic old motorbikes and they, you know, from a kid growing up, they all know how to fix bikes. So you're probably in better standing with them, um, with those type of bikes for all the, you know, if you ever need parts and stuff like that. Um, things things that, I, that I regularly did along the way was, I mean, I changed my oil twice uh, on, the, on the trip myself. I also, um, you know, keep maintaining your chain. Um, I ended up getting a new chain also in Cartagena, uh, only because of that, when I had that accident, um, the chain stretched and, 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 and bent a little and a couple of the links was a little bit damaged. Uh, it was still fine, but you know, for over the long journey, I would have ended up having trouble, so I changed the chain as well. Um, so all up, you know, but, and, and it wasn't expensive. The, the, the the, the two other services in the really nice places were were like six hundred dollars, um, uh, and there would have might have been a couple little parts here and there with that. Um, but the the one in um, in Cartagena was only three hundred and sixty, and they had the bike for like seven eight days. Um, so yeah, uh, one one of the uh, the things that you um, that you quickly learn along the way. I'm sorry about the, having that microphone strap sticking out of my helmet, but I didn't realize it until I looked at the footage. <laughs> um, but uh, one of the things you realize along the way is that the distances that you can travel, um, and here I am going up the inside, which is not always recommended, um, but the, the, with the distance you travel, you, it's really up to the towns on, on how, how far you actually get. But I always found as a rule that if Google Maps said it was going to take me 10 hours and then I had like a 15 minute break every two hours, that I'd still get there in 10 hours. So it was pretty accurate. You get there earlier. If you wanted to go fast, um, you can get there a lot earlier, I suppose. Um, but there's just people doing everything. That guy carrying a ladder on a motorbike. And, um, so you can see all the motorbike places everywhere all the, all the time through all the towns. Um, but what I carry with me, as far as um, as far as just for maintaining the bike, would be the chain the chain lube. Um, I'd I'd also have um, some uh, uh, WD forty. I'd have obviously my tools. I'd have um, uh, some cable ties, uh, and I I ended up having uh, having a. a Thing of coolant as well, just because uh, I just got a bit spooked by that coolant the first time, so I just bought a thing. So I ended up having that the whole trip, didn't use it. Uh, actually, no, I did. I, I changed the coolant once. Um, so yeah, the coolant's supposed to last about ten thousand miles, you know, um, a year uh, on the bike. But yeah, going through all these towns in Colombia, some of the countries are a lot more on the motorcycles than, than others. But Colombia is a big motorcycle uh, country. Uh, a lot of people with the motorbikes, you know. Um, but I just took my time through the towns. I didn't. I wasn't in in a massive rush. Um, they, these mopeds are pretty slow. <laughs> I, I don't think I saw that uh, tope and speed up until late. But yeah, some of them have. Some of them, the, the more major cities have traffic lights. A lot of them don't bother. There's a little girl. Yeah, so this this trip this trip ended up being about um, seven seven hundred kilometres, about four hundred and four hundred and eight miles, I think. Um, and it was a it was a nice day. So I, I hadn't been riding for a few weeks, so it was just great to get back on the bike and and get out there. I had a really really great time in Cartagena, relaxed, did a fair bit of work uh, over a few weeks um, for my with my business and. Uh, Unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to do anything with videos because, again, I mean, the internet was pretty good at the place I stayed, but if you if you left the internet inactive, this is a really annoying thing about hotels is, you know, especially hotels that are remote, where they have passwords for their Wi-Fi, it's just so silly. I mean, everyone, if you've got a remote hotel, why have passwords for Wi-Fi? Anyone outside of the hotel is not going to be able to access it. Um, but uh, the really annoying thing was, 
even if you're uploading a video, if there was any, there, and these are those flip flops, so Samba Soul flip flops, um, and I've got a pair for Columbia, so they're, um, I've, I've got some involvement in the company, not a huge amount, um, but uh, yeah, they make flip flops for every single, um, nearly every single country in the world. Uh, they, yeah, so they, I've got a pair of Australian ones, and I was lucky enough to, to because I'm involved when we went to do the Australian ones. The design on my motorbike is now the design on the flip flops for Australia, and it's pretty cool. I'm pretty pr pretty proud of that. Um, and uh, the um, yeah, so the the, the design is a flip flops for Australia. But the the um, the 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 things that I sort of um, I'm going to get back to with the things that I take with me on, on the bike uh, that I made sure I just did maintenance. So basically, every day before I rode, um, and if I went, and, and every, even if in the evening after I went through, if I did a fair bit of off-roading, I'd check all the bolts on the bike. So all the protection gear, just do a quick check over to make sure nothing's loose, because if you end up losing a bolt, you might not be able to get the same type. I ended up losing one uh, from one of my side cases came right off. Uh, I'd lost the nut, but I, was, I kept the screw. Um, so, you know, but that's going to happen. 100% guaranteed you're going to, that's going to happen, especially on a long adventure like this, that you're going to lose it. Um, so if you've got regular type nuts across across the board then and bolts, uh, then I would basically try, just take a couple with you, just a couple of spare ones. Um, but doing a, a, a little check over the bike. Um, so I check the chain tension. Um, I check, uh, you can usually tell if your chain's a bit, a bit loose anyway. I mean, when you go to accelerate it, there's a bit of a, Bit of a clunk as you as you accelerate, like a bit of a pull, like it's like pulling the rope tight. Each time you accelerate, you'll see, you'll know that you'll need to tighten your chain. Um, it with, with your chains will, that's going to happen over a long period of time, anyway. Uh, and normally you're going to have enough enough give on your on uh, to be able to uh, with any chain to be able to uh, make it a more tense. Um, you, you're not gonna, there was one guy I met, an Italian guy in uh, Patagonia that had a BMW and we maxed out how much you could put on the tension and it was still loose. I mean, that's just poor maintenance from the people he hired the bike from. This is not 100% advisable. Um, but this is the sort of thing you see through towns with the trucks and all that sort of stuff. You just gotta make your way through um, as much as you can. They're all going pretty slowly, so. So as you get yeah, as you get higher up into the mountains, you'll 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 find that there'll be there'll be water on the road in certain places, and uh, it'll have rained there recently. So, but the rivers are absolutely chock a block full. They were flowing crazy. Like there's no way known anyone could swim in any of these rivers. I think I've got a little video up a bit further about that. I used to, st it, because I had the second phone, I could stop quickly and take a photo every now and then when I was on the road, and as long as there wasn't too many cars be behind me, I used to do a bit of that, but um, preferably you'd actually stop and have a bit of a look around. I, I stopped a bit further up here and took a few photos um, once the river crossed onto the left side. Because it was, it was, it was insanity. The, the amount of uh, the, the amount of water that was flowing. I mean, if they ever had hydro there, it'd be, it'd be amazing. And then you'll find also on the side of the road where they set up these little um, uh, like wash stations where they can wash your bike or so your car and stuff like that. You'll see them on the right. There's, that's where there's a lot of water on the road. And so all the trucks they they wash the trucks maybe for a dollar or something, a few dollars or whatever they do. They're all set up to do it. And there's all these hoses just spewing out water all the time directly from the, because the the pressure coming down the, from the thing, I, I gather they can, so yeah, but it's a little bit, can get a little bit slippery when you're not looking for it, you know. Um, yeah, but this uh, th this riding just so much fun, you know. You don't even you don't even realise you're doing a lot of miles when you when you 
when you're riding on this sort of stuff, it just feels so much fun. You do get tired though after a long period of time of doing the twisties. You do you, you, your arms do get a little bit tired, but it is it is so much fun. And then getting stuck behind trucks all the time as well. You got a bit of acceleration. That's a bit risky that one. That was a little bit too risky that one. Um, but with, with my bike, like I had so much power, you know, um, you just got to make sure you've got plenty of, you've got enough room to get through. You all these stops here with those cones, they're military stops. Um, you can choose to stop. Sometimes they're not military stops, they're just people trying to make you slow down to sell you something. But a lot of fun riding through the mountains. I mean, it's one of the, one of the real pleasures of, uh, on the trip is, is is having the you know the ability the the opportunity to ride through these these sort of mountains and then look down out of the side and think wow that's just so cool you know it doesn't look like there's a lot of room there but there is I had plenty of room you know um, yeah so and so the the only um, the only downer on this trip was uh, is going to be coming up soon and that's where I, I was I. Uh, I witnessed an accident where a kid got killed. Um, I was a fair way away. I was about 400 yards away. I was, as I was leaving the town, I saw him do what he did. It was just outside of the town, and again, it's a uh, it's a thing you've got to be really, really careful of through towns because that's where everyone's in a rush and people are, you know, trying to jockey position and get in and out of trucks and stuff like that. And, um, yeah, this kid just came out from behind a truck, and there was another one coming the other way. There was no room on the road, basically. It was like two lanes right next to each other coming out of, out of a town. It's just stopping off on a, there was a really pretty little farmland and there's about 200 workers on it as well. This place, that place there was a really nice place as well, but they don't, this is really pretty too. There was some uh, towns up into the up on the mountains, uh, like right on the on the the cliff edge type thing. Uh, it's pretty cool. Can't, it doesn't really show that well here, but and so you'll notice some of the topes also. Uh, they just they just paint lines. They say there's a tope and they just paint yellow on the road. So there's a, you can see that like right up on the mountain there if I can hold steady for a second. It's a really cool town. So this was just after this town is where um, where that accident took place. It was pretty sad. The saddest thing about the whole thing is I thought, well, you know, people might, because on my trip today, I was just always commenting on people doing insane things. Uh, overtaking and that, like right on corners and stuff like that, on motorbikes and in, and in particularly minibuses, were doing it. And I was just thinking, this is just insane. And then after the accident, I thought, well, people will settle down. But you know, 200 yards up the road, everyone was doing the same thing again. You know? um, so it was pretty. It was a pretty sad thing, pretty sobering uh, experience. You know. And after that, I thought, no, okay, no. Don't, don't worry about rushing, just take my time. But even though I was way behind schedule because I think I had a better... Well, the thing is, they, this is the thing is, if that happened in America and someone was killed outside of the town, the road would be closed and the investigators would come in and all this sort of stuff. Where we were, it took maybe from when the accident happened to when they cleared the body off the road and they put the bike on the back of the... the um, they put the bike on the back of a truck and they put the body in a like a, a van and um, and then just everyone was allowed to ride through again, you know. And I was just thinking as I was riding, like, you know, that his mum doesn't even know, you know. His family doesn't know that he's died, you know. And what a terrible thing to hear, you know. And, and you know, all because he was, he was just in a rush, you know, and the, the difference in time from I don't know where he was going or where he came from, but the difference in time would be minutes. Yeah, just just not worth it, and it's just uh, insanity that people do that sort of stuff. And 
but the, the the worst the worst culprits for me on the road were and you'll get used to that too where trucks and buses are overtaking and you just got to move over um, but people just uh, the, the buses like the mini buses like I'm thinking that you've got like 10 12 people in your bus and you're protecting their lives and you're overtaking on corners and bipping your horn you know they'd only take somebody else on the other side of them bipping their horn that's that's one of the rivers there as you can see it's just it's just pretty cool flying crazy you know? hello so yeah so it's um it's it's a thing where you where you uh where you uh you've just got to basically work out where you're going to go and if you're going to get there a little bit late just get there a little bit late it's no it's no use rushing because there's so many trucks on the road and and the trucks are doing like for you to take risks around corners trucks are coming outside of your corners all the time and stuff like that onto your side of the road buses and stuff like that so you're better off just not even bothering and just saying oh well i'm just going to take my time you know um it just you know it just makes so much more sense to do it that way um the worst country i think that i went to was probably peru was was just on the insanity level uh peru was probably the worst of them um and you'll go through it'll be sunny in one place and then it'll be rainy like this and wet in, in others and then when it gets wet you just take your time because your tires tires are dry and and uh and probably a lot more air in them uh, because you've been riding for a while so a little bit a little bit more slippery um, but yeah I think we're coming up now to I'm coming up to the town now where I, I, I don't have the video of the accident because I had it turned I, usually I turn the camera on as I enter the town and as I was just as I was leaving I turn it off I turned the camera on for a few minutes after the accident but what happened was the cops just stopped everywhere and everyone just everyone was just riding right up really close to it and I thought just give the got people some room you know and then they ended up taping it off but people were like people were riding up past me like you know 10 five meters from the body like I stopped about well 40 50 meters from the body and I just thought oh, I'm just gonna stop you I didn't really want to see anything anyway but they were just standing there like within within a minute the police were there and all these people were there and they were just standing around so I knew the guy was dead and no one was trying to help him or anything um, yeah, he was completely flattened um, yeah it was just this is a town uh, that it happened in as I came outside of this town and you'll see here so the body the body is there up on the left um, but all these people like the um, that was a truck that he overtook, um, and the bus had, the bus was was already let through that he overtook. They didn't question the guy at all, uh, even though it wasn't the bus driver's fault. Um, so there's the van with the body. So as soon as the body's leaving, everyone's going, you know. And the thing about it, after I I, I was actually talking and. Um, the, they just loaded the body in the truck and the van left like a, 10 seconds after they put the body in the truck, in the van. Um, but the, the thing about it is, is that everyone just started riding crazy again straight away. You know, um, no one was, had, had any thoughts about it at all, you know. It was just really weird. It was a really, yeah, sad experience. And then, you know, to have people next to you, like, chatting and laughing and stuff like that I, I felt like really felt like I felt sick you know um, but anyway uh, it's a sad thing and uh, yeah there was about a 20-25 minute wait all up um, from when, once the accident happened to when it cleared um, but yeah so yeah, sad sad moment and it wasn't the first I'd, I'd, I'd encounter either um, but nearly all the accidents that I, I think every, pretty much every accident I saw except for one between two trucks was actually in a town. Um, and you know, all of it, nearly all of them were, that I, that I saw were 100% avoidable, just from people being rush, rushing and stuff like that. Um, 
but yeah, there are some of the other riders I'd spoken to had also witnessed one. One, one witnessed. Uh, uh, so there's a body up there on the left. Uh, one witnessed a, uh, a lady getting hit as she was crossing her old and old lady, um, which is you know, which you see a lot where they come, you, they walk out from behind a truck, you know. So they, and again, it's through a town, you know. A spectacular view, here though. Um, so yeah, I'm getting closer here into Medellin, where I'd spend a few nights, get my bike to the KTM in Medellin, where the guys were absolutely fantastic. I stayed at a, a place called the Charlie Hotel, which was a pretty expensive hotel. Um, however, it was a re really, really cool hotel. Um, internet was pretty good, but the, the most spectacular thing was the balcony. I've, uh, we, that's 100% the, the correct way to do balconies. It, I mean, they probably overdid it a bit. They had a, you had your own barbecue area and everything on the balcony, and um, so they could have a private chef come up and and cook you. Uh, uh, Teppanyaki, I think they call it, um, a, a grill where they can cook you in front, you know, so if you have guests, uh, um, they, they'll, they'll actually have send a chef up there, obviously you pay for it, I didn't do that, um, but a really good setup, undercover, with a really pretty view down of, down, down at the, in this, it, I stayed in a pretty nice area in Medellin, in a, near the square, um, yeah, there's some, another bus driver, just overtaking around corners um, but uh, it was a really really great hotel that I stayed in uh, you know probably just just let down the only thing that was let down from it was the buffet breakfast that they advertised and it was it wasn't a, a mean buffet breakfast it was some pieces of cheese I mean it was nicely presented and all that cheese and rolls and stuff like that and you could all order uh, scramble, you could order eggs and stuff like that, but it was very basic. I ended up just going to a local cafe and just having a nice eggs and egg bacon set, um, bricky. Um, but yeah, so now I'm basically heading back down into Medellin now. Um, and this is where I found out a bit further on, I, I found out that I, my coolant was, uh, my, my coolant was leaking everywhere and, um, the purple fluid was was spewing purpley blue fluid was spewing out all over my all over the road, and and I basically got up the the engine heat got up to like one bar before friggin' badness. So I was right up the top. So I ended up basically having to just take the bike in the middle of traffic, take the bike off the road, and just sit for I sat for about an hour, just waiting for the bike to cool down and the traffic got a bit better. Um, but I was pretty happy to once I got in there and then I knew I had to go and find the KTM guys and I can't remember what day it was that I got here but I uh, I only had one day where where the shop was open so I don't know whether I spent two nights or three nights here um, it might have, I might have spent three nights here I'm not sure I'll, I'll find out um, but uh, it was um, Medellin is a, a really pretty city and um, there's lots of things to do. You can go up on the cart and the cable car all the way up the top, which I did, which is really cool. Um, and some really fantastic restaurants. Um, it's it's one of the more expensive cities in, well, it probably is the most expensive city in Colombia. Um, maybe in the, the nice parts of Bogota, uh, there, it's, uh, it's expensive too, but um, yeah, so this is coming into Medellin, and I'm still, it's, I'm, you can see it's now the sun setting and it's, I'm still probably about one hour from, from even though I'm only about 20 miles away, I'm still one hour from the, from the, uh, from my, de my destination, and you can see the city in the background, and you know, I think it, I can't remember, I thought it said like 20, but it might have only been 10 miles, one hour, and I was just thinking that's not right. You know, usually when that happens on your bike, you've got like a river crossing or something like that that you've got to go over on a on a boat when it tells you that it's going to take you that long. Um, but yeah, so it was a, a bit of a, a bit of a pain in the backside. You know, after all that all the trouble I had with the front tire leaking and and that then to have it serviced and and for them not to do things correctly, 
um, it was pretty frustrating, especially since they had the bike for seven, eight days, of which obviously they only worked about one, one maybe one and a half days on the actual bike. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a pretty uh, frustrating experience, but a beautiful city and some great roads to ride up into the mountains to get some great photos. Thanks for just driving in front of me there, buddy. Um, some, yeah, some great, uh, great uh, views up, up from up on the mountainside along the city. It's a, it's a city that's sort of built down inside a valley with mountains all around. Um, and it's definitely a, a place you want to visit. Um, a lot of pretty art and, uh, and uh, art areas and stuff like that. But um, yeah, I ended up getting stuck in traffic for quite a while. Um, even though I'm not far from the actual my destination. So, but anyway, so that's that's the area that I stayed um, in Medellin. It's a nice square that was just below where I stayed. Very very pretty, um, very touristy, and but I mean this is a local area, but a lot of tourists go there. So you can see a lot of sort of art installations around the place, and all the buildings are painted. That was the buffet breakfast. So just the cheese. That's it. I went to this one. Uh, there was a uh, Brasa Reaper, which is a bit of a famous sort of cafe in um, in in in, in uh, Medellin. Uh, I think uh, Anthony Bourdain. Um, that's where we have breakfast at the hotel. Um, I think I've got some photos of upstairs. So yeah, this is the upstairs area. So that's the balcony. Fantastic, isn't it? Really great place to sort of relax. And I aired out all my, my gear and um, I had a little bit of a sleep on that as well. Um, but a really, really nice hotel. And uh, definitely, if you can afford it, uh, definitely one to have a go at. There's some views from outside the city. It looks a lot better when you're actually there in line. It looks pretty awesome. That's, that's another view of the city there. Pretty awesome shot. That's the KTM. So you can see it's a lot more advanced, the KTM in, uh, in, in uh, Medellin. But anyway, guys, as always, questions and comments below. Thank you.